Well, thank you very much. That was a very nice invitation, a very nice uh, introduction. It, there's a joke I can't remember, and I'm trying to about moving from the north to the south. Uh, someone said uh, you can you can put kittens in the oven, and it doesn't make them biscuits. And I think that was I can't remember what. The, so if, if you know the joke, let me know. Um, so you know, as, as was mentioned, um, I'm a scientist first, and uh, I've always been really interested in agriculture. Always have been very. Uh, interested in contributing to ways to help our farmers grow better and farm uh, in ways that are profitable, uh, thinking about environmental sustainability, all the good stuff that we do. But one of the big issues I've had is how do we get by this public ignorance, the problem that's happening about the public perception about what we do as agricultural producers, as scientists, you know, we're, we're very much the same. Um, we tend to talk to each other very well. We tend to talk to, um, uh, we, we, we talk to each other just fine, but we're not good at stepping out of that and talking to other people. And um, my whole story in communication and where that led, but the bottom line is, is that if we want to see things change about agriculture and the perception of agriculture and our freedom to operate in agriculture, we all have to be part of the conversation and we have to step into it effectively. And most of all, we just have to do it in the right way, right place in the right, right way. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. Um, I didn't learn this by reading thick books about communication. I didn't learn this about, uh, by hanging around universities. I learned about this by meeting audiences where they are. And I've talked with concerned people, concerned parents, um, uh, with physicians, with dietitians, with farmers, you, you name it. And this is what I've learned along the way over the last years. And really what it is is a boots on the ground uh, plan and playbook on how we can be better at communicating what we do in agriculture with the idea of maintaining freedom to operate, being, have, having access to the best technologies, and uh, being able to maintain profitable farming from the 1% of our population that still does it. So um, my uh, research is in genomics and molecular biology. I work mostly with understanding the basis of fruit flavors and how to make fruits and vegetables taste better so that people are more willing to buy more of them, um, make better food choices. My main job is I'm a chair of a department of 55 faculty, and what it means is that I spend a lot of time interacting with our growers, I spend a lot of time in the field, um, actually studying the problems that are there so that we're focusing our faculty on solving real problems for our producers. And uh, we cover a large array of different types of research um, areas. And one of the big parts of what I do, though, is step out with the public and step into the public. And this started when I was in Wisconsin at this place, Willie Street Co-op. And Willie Street Co-op is um, a small uh, uh, employee-owned, uh, mostly organic, local, that whole thing. This was at the corner of my street, so I'd go there and buy things here and there. The people were what nice, wonderful people who ran the place. But they had a very strong attitude against technology. They opposed any kinds of farm inputs, fertilizers, insecticides, anything, and they definitely were against genetic engineering, this whole GMO thing. And as a scientist who understood these things, I said, well, maybe I could come in and do a talk, and, and, and I could tell you about what I know as a scientist, and, and you're going to feel a whole lot better about this, right? So uh, we got together in the community room, very nice people, everybody showed up, and I went on to tell them about the tiny details of DNA. I talked about the minute details of proteins and enzymes and why it was safe and the chemistry behind the insecticides and all the details that, um, that I thought were important and were very, made me feel very comfortable with technology, probably would make most of you feel comfortable with that technology. But to that audience of skeptics, guess how many hearts and minds I changed that day? <laughs> zero point zero, right? I didn't change any hearts and minds because I forgot who I was talking to. I didn't speak the right words to the right language, and I could have walked out of there and, and really changed that conversation. So I'd only spend the next 12 years doing it wrong, figured out how to get it right, and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, one of the big things I've done is reach out in many different ways to the public. And as I mentioned before, I speak to physicians, I speak to dietitians, I speak to classrooms of kids all the time. And uh, really started to get some momentum. 
I would get emails about how I changed people's minds about food and farming. I would get, um, uh, there, people would write stories online in their blogs about how they used to feel this way and then switched to this way. It was um, a lot of change that was being created because we finally were getting the messaging correct. It was really starting to change hearts and minds. My inbox from that point forward it was always full of questions, people just wanting to know something about their food. I earned their trust. And when you earn the trust of people, some funny things happen. Well, the first thing that happened was um, a rather large agricultural company said, we love that you do this. And what we're going to do is we're going to help you defray the cost of doing it. I was paying to do this out of pocket. Um, essentially, if I, did a speak, if I did a talk somewhere and was given a speaker fee, I would invest that into these programs so that I could deliver more content to more diverse audiences. And it maybe would pay for a night in a hotel. It would let me put out sandwiches so that I could ha talk to scientists and have them actually show up because there was free food because, you know, they hard to motivate them to get away from the computer and come out and actually you know, talk to us. And... Um, that, no problem there, it was, it was all above board, all accounted by the university standards, no problem at all. But the, the people who wanted to stop this messaging, they didn't want me talking and changing hearts and minds. They didn't want me talking to, uh, to farmers who then would go and talk to people and would go to their Rotary Club and would go to the other organizations and would speak to others about what they do in a, in a way that was working. They needed me to stop. So what they did was, and I'm a public employee, um, I'm paid by the University of, by the state of Florida, so I'm financed by tax dollars. And uh, my research is funded almost exclusively by federal money, so by you, so thank you. And uh, they wanted to stop me from doing this. So this is what's called the Freedom of Information Act to obtain my emails. Now, I never thought that you could do this. Uh, they, get, they can say, we want all the emails from these companies and anything that has the word this in it. You know, we, they can take these broad searches and gather all your emails. And believe me, I'm not careful about what I say. I speak my mind, I tell the truth, it's there, and they got it. It's no big deal. And I turned over uh, initially 4,600 pages, now about 70,000 pages of email. No big deal. I mean, I don't really care. Um, I don't have anything to hide. But when you give 70,000 pages of email to people who want you to stop what you're doing, they find a way to put together stories that aren't true. And I found in, uh, it was September two years ago, I found myself on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, and it says, uh, based on these emails, here are uh, scientists who are trading grants for lobbying cred. Trading grants for lobbying. So they're saying that, I'm, that my communication and speaking with farmers, physicians, children, nursing homes, you name it, is lobbying on behalf of companies. Um, I'm not allowed to be a lobbyist. I'm not, uh, it, since I work for the state, it's illegal for me to, to do any kind of lobbying without, without I just can't do it. Uh, they put this on the paper and my life changed in a, in a very, very uh, bad way. Um, the author who wrote this thing interviewed me for four hours and didn't use any of it. He went with the story that the activists gave him, and uh, they basically threw me under the bus. When this happened, um, the rest of it, I mean, just went crazy. The internet exploded with um, a lot of stuff that wasn't true and was really, really difficult and really painful. A lot of this was really bad because uh, even... Um, uh, it, all they did was donate to a program so I could teach people, you know. And so public money was used to uh, get my emails, which attorneys had to go through page at a time at your expense to take out someone who works for you. And this is the state of things out there. It's a really awful situation for folks like who try to get into the public and just simply teach the science. Um, a lot of other stuff happened. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty ugly. Um, on Craigslist in my town, they put a thing up about my deceased mother. Um, you know, I mean, it was, I had uh, all kinds of stuff. I had to meet with the FBI. My boss met with the FBI because of legitimate threats against me and my family. Um, I got emails that would say, we know where your wife rides her bike. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, but long story short, and the reason I show this isn't because I want you to do whack heaven. I want you to understand against as people who are defending agriculture and people who are stepping into this and doing our best to fight for what's right. 
And the reason I show this is, is because I want you to feel a very strong sense of joining me in this, in this particular arena. It's important to have the voices of agricultural producers. It's important to have the voices of trusted, competent people out there. And they can't do this to everybody. They can do it to me because I'm a public employee. They can't touch you. So what we need is for you to be stepping into this conversation to stand with me and, and stand up for agriculture and stand up for what's right. So what they really wanted to do was take away this trust that I had earned. I'd spend the right thing in becoming more and more visible in this area and earning the trust of people who just were concerned about their food. And the activists wanted to take that away. Um, and what I learned from all of this is, is that um, you can survive it as, a, as an academic who, who this happens to, but how do we fight back? And how do we stand up for what's right? And how do we push back effectively? What I would like to spend the rest of the time talking about are the things that I've learned to be effective in this space. And the reason I told this story in the beginning is because I want you to understand how you can make a huge difference just by spending 15 minutes a week stepping into the public discussion in really productive ways. There's a lot of us out there doing it, and we really need your voice. So what we'll talk about today is just how we build trust. And I should mention that this isn't just a um, discussion of how to stand up for agriculture. When I started to learn these things, it changed the way that I did my job as a manager of a university department. It changed the way that uh, other relationships that I had. Um, just about any relationship you have benefits from these kinds, of, um, these kinds of strategies. So how to build rapport, the evidence that we should use, and where do we meet the public, and some advice on dealing with critics. So um, we'll talk basically about three books. Um, information from three different books, one from a, a Nobel Prize winning economist called Thinking Fast and Slow, one from a former FBI hostage negotiator named Chris Never Split the Difference, and something from customer service from Hug Your Haters by Jay Bayer. So we're not going to talk about the details of science. We're not going to talk about principles of agriculture. We're not going to talk about the details of what we do on a farm. Instead, we're going to talk about more about psychology, the way people make decisions, and how we can earn their trust and be influential in those discussions. So here are all the uh, familiar buzzwords, right? All the things that you see um, store on labels or on packages. People are concerned about pesticides, antibiotics, you name it, uh, gluten, you know, GMO, neonics, all these buzzwords that people don't know even know what they mean, but they're worried about them. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. There's really three different segments of the population. We have one group of people who really understand these issues and spend a lot of time understanding from the right people, talking to farmers, talking to uh, scientists, getting good information from trustable sources and making good decisions about their food. But there's this very small vocal group in this yellow piece of the pie who say the sky is falling, that their food is poison that seed companies are creating uh, compounds in the food to control, that farmers are spending 400 hours a month uh, to barely break even with the intent of destroying their customers. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that's out there, right? So that is a very small minority. The majority of people are in that blue part of the pie. And these are the folks that we need to be talking to. They don't know who to trust. They've read information on the internet that says that, that, that what's happening in agriculture is dangerous and problematic. They don't know who to trust. And they're just worried about their health. They're worried about their families. Um, I, I can think of colleagues of mine and things that I've done in the past where I've gone to that group of people in the middle and I've said, listen, I'm a scientist. Get over it. You know, it, there's nothing you need to worry about. Forget about it. And it really was the wrong approach, that we need to be much different in our strategies in approaching the public audiences and, um, and employ some tactics that we don't normally do. Um, you know, we're not good as scientists with touchy-feely soft um, language. We're not, uh, and I know certainly our agricultural producers don't like to operate in that space either frequently. So how do we do this? And I'll talk about that today. So this is the person we need to be talking to because when they make bad decisions, we see them erring to the side of precaution. They tend to make lifestyle-based purchases rather than uh, information and uh, good information-based evidence-backed choices. They make mistakes and it leads to bad policy. And that bad policy ultimately affects 
the types of crop protection strategies that farmers can employ. It can affect uh, policy that uh, the types of seeds that can be used. And it also can affect uh, the food prices on the poorest people in the, in the nation and the people in pot that matter. So these are, uh, these are some aspects of th bad things that can happen because the people in the middle of the curve don't understand what we're doing in agriculture. They also, as I mentioned before, have consequences that affect the poorest among us. The big issue is, is that there's this big divide and as a scientist, it's really frustrating to see this, that we know that there are outstanding technologies that can revolutionize the farming, can decrease inputs, can do great things for the environment, more profitable strategies for farmers, and great benefits for the poorest people in the world. We know, especially in the area of genetic engineering, that we can do this. But we can't do this. There's this big divide between the things we can do and our freedom to deploy those, those, those um, solutions. And this is really frustrating for a scientist like me because we're doing this with the public good in mind. You know, I don't profit from these things. We just create these uh, solutions so that they can make things better. And we can't use them. And there's, there's thousands of labs with solutions in their freezers and in their refrigerators that taxpayers paid for that we can't use because of pushback. So the solution to this, I think a lot of the solution to this lies in our agricultural producers themselves. How do we get our farmers and ranchers stepping out into the conversation and talking to the public? It have to be part of this public of, of the discussion. Have to participate. The problem is, is that um, that that's not always an easy thing to do. Part of the problem is, is that it's not simple because uh, we're not trained to do this. We make mistakes when we do it, and you know what? Scientists don't like to do this um, in general. It's very rare for uh, people who choose careers in academic science, uh, they tend to be people who are a little more insular, who like very comfortable in their laboratory and with their peers, but maybe not really excited about talking to the public and stepping into what could be a contentious discussion. And certainly these days, they don't want to end up on the front page of the New York Times, you know, uh, smeared, uh, you know, with their reputation smeared. So how do you get people to step into these discussions? And um, the whole thing really boils down to the way we communicate up with people and the way that we consume information. And this is where we talk about this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. The brain is broken down into two parts, and this is what Kahneman argues. The first part of the brain is what he calls system one, the very fast part of the brain. If I say two plus two, you say four, right? Real easy. This is the part of the brain that, that protects us. Okay, this is the part of the brain that when we sense a threat, we run the other way. That when we hear something happen over there, we might, uh, rather than run towards it, we run away from it. This is that reptile part of the brain, which has ensured the success of many generations because of the good decisions to avoid threats. Very, very powerful. We have this other part of the brain, which is, and I should mention that this can be very responsive to emotional, very irrational. That reptile brain is a funny thing. We have this very logical, strategic, and calculating brain, which is what Kahneman refers to as system two. Rational, and thinking, and, and synthesizing, and putting together information before making a decision. Like if I told you 584 times 941. You know, slower, calculating, but you can do it. That's this executive function. So you have this executive function part of the brain that's putting together information to make decisions, fighting against this rapid fire, quick, emotional, irrational part of the brain um, that's operating in a different way. And so all of the fearful messages that come, from, uh, that come from the people who are fighting against agriculture are appealing to that reptile brain, appealing to system one, scaring people, using fear to, to make them change their decisions. Now, for whatever reason, I was born without system one. <laughs> I don't respond to fearful messaging. Uh, someone can try to scare me into making a decision, I won't do it. Um, I never made a decision based in fear in my life. Probably something that will eventually get me killed. But I think system two is where I operate. That's maybe why I got into science. I'm very comfortable with logic and, and, and reason and putting information together. But so this understanding the human brain as these two different systems is a really important foundation for us to be able to, dis to, to formulate good strategies to communicate with people about their fears around food. The other important thing for us to remember is that people are trying. 
And it's, a, again, a very old, ancient part of the brain that we like, to, we like to be with people who are like us. We like to share experiences with people who share common values and common ties. This is something that's very ingrained in, 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 the, in the reason why we've been so successful. We have these behaviors that make us group with people who have common worldviews and interests. And we see, you can think about this all the time. I mean, we're all here, right? You know, this is our tribe. Um, we adopt and defend similar premises, even if they're incorrect. You know, we, we tend to fall into these clades, and we can think about political examples of this across the spectrum. Uh, we can see groups that anchor their beliefs together because of, because of tr very strong tribal bonds that bring us together. And we even manufacture tribes because it's a good time. We find people who have similar interests. I mean, think about football in the state, right? I mean, I mean we, we, we put together groups that we have very many differences, yet we can coalesce around these common themes. And it's fun, and it's, and it's, and it's good, and it's supportive, and it's a wonderful environment for us to do that. So we have this idea of this reptile brain. We have tribal behaviors that we have. And these are part of the problems that we have to get around when we want to communicate effectively about agriculture and science. So how do we do that? And the big part is, is that we have to get away from that reptile brain. We have to get people to realize that we are not a threat. That scientists, ag producers, that we're not a threat to them. That when, we, when we're um, selling them a product or talking to them about a technology on the farm, we have to understand that they have concerns and that, we're not, that we are a part of a solution, not a threat to their existence. And getting around that, we have to be able to do something important. We have to be able to show empathy and build rapport. And two very important words. And these are words that we don't talk about in science. We don't talk about rapport and listening and all this stuff. We don't do that. And it's probably not a big thing with, uh, in, in, uh, among ag producers either. I mean, I know it's not. It's not, it's not the way we usually operate. But it's about this idea of building rapport. And if there's one thing I, I would want you to take home, it's the importance of this kind of, of building rapport as part of a communication strategy. The news is, is that scientists and uh, ag producers have a very good foundation to build trust. Okay, we, have, we already have that, just by being who we are. We're competent. You know, we know our stuff, okay? We're knowledgeable and the public feels that way too. We have a very good basis to be able to step into those conversations. The problem is, is that we don't do it and when we do it, we do it wrong. So that's, that's where we're, but the, the point of this slide is, is that we have a good basis for this. We're not starting from zero. So how do we build trust? Well, one of the things that we would do as scientists is I would say, well, we just need to educate them. We need to give them more information. We'll dump data on them and show them figure five. We'll talk about the statistical relevance and the error and the p-value, and this will make them feel a whole lot better, right? The mistakes that I made back at Willie Street Co-op. We can't educate ourselves out of this. That's really a frightening thing for scientists to say. We can't educate our professor, you know? You can't profess, we can't educate our way this is about communication and not necessarily education. The problem is, is that facts don't change people's minds. Think about uh, political climate. Think about political discussions. Facts don't always matter. And that's, a, again, for scientists, that's, that's a frightening thing to say. Facts don't matter. Facts don't matter until you establish trust. And once you've established trust, now we start to see ways that facts can matter. So we first have to establish trust. And really a great quotation from Maya Angelou is, and I know I'll read it for those in the back, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And when we're trying to share, we're not changing the way they feel. We're piling information on with the idea that they're going to change if we just dump enough data on them. That's the way that scientists have always operated. That's the way many of the folks in our state in agriculture have always operated. Well, I'll just tell them about what we're using. I'll just tell them about the seeds we're, you know, I'll just explain the technology behind it. They'll be fine. It's not what changes people's mind. So how do we go about building that trust? And how do we build those, that rapport? And we'll talk about a couple different areas today. Extremely useful in building this. And this is the most important line. If you take home one thing, this might be it. Who is the audience we need to talk to? And what are those people feeling? What, what's going on in their hearts and in their heads? And people are seeking honest answers about science, medicine, food, and farming, and they don't know who to trust. They don't know if it's the internet celebrity. 
They don't know if it's the TV doctor. They don't know if it's the celebrity chef. They don't know. They don't know if it's a university professor. Because they managed to take some good shots at me to erode the trust that I accumulate. So people are curious. Who do we trust? Who do we pay attention to? And the first thing that we have to do is avoid talking to the wrong people. We can't talk to that yellow piece of the pie. We can't have arguments with people who, uh, who have very staunch opinions about food and farming that they didn't make from evidence. Don't waste your time with them. Talk to the people who are just concerned about their food and their families. You know, these are people that in their hearts, they believe that there's something wrong. They really do, and, and, and we have to understand that. And if we understand that and accept that, now we can create the change we need to see. We have to focus on the right people. And I just will throw this kind of an interesting formula that someone told me was that trust is really a question of, of competence and intimacy. How much somebody knows versus how close they feel to you uh, divided by the risk in certain situations. I know that's kind of a you know, academic egghead way to put this, but maybe you can take something home from that is that it's this, it's this formula of understanding how well someone is trusted, their ethics, and their competence, their knowledge, uh, with their intimacy, how well they've related. And so the rest, of this, uh, the rest of this communication strategy really is built around this idea. The whole idea is this idea of rapport. And rapport, how do we develop rapport? And what does rapport mean? And this is a great definition. It's a close and harmonious relationship in which people or groups concerned understand each other's feelings and communicate well. So in other words, this is saying that when we understand what someone else is feeling and what their concerns are, and we show them that, now they're going to listen to us. And it's so true. And the best examples come from crisis situations. And how do you win the trust of someone that is emotional and irrational, who's not making decisions based on evidence? How do we change their mind? And this is a good example. Here's someone who's in a very bad situation in law enforcement effect, trying to affect an important change that they cannot lose. They can't lose this, this particular interaction. We also see this in hostage. Um, very, very tense situations. A hostage taker is irrational. A hostage taker is emotional. A hostage taker is not going to respond to evidence and information that someone's going to give them. And the old situation is, is that police would say, okay, we're going to send down a SWAT team that will repel in through the wall. Then we're going to throw in a flash grenade and distract the hostage taker, and we have snipers at five different stations who will try to take him out. People got killed. People got injured. We lost a lot of hostages that way. And that was all described in a book named uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. And he was a New York City hostage negotiator. So New York City is the fifth largest standing ar army on the planet. Uh, and Chris Voss was their hostage negotiator. And in his book, he talked about the ways that he changed the way that he approached a hostage situation. And he did it by listening. He built rapport with that hostage taker by saying, why are you doing this? Can you tell me what's bothering you? Can you help me understand why you feel it's important to do this? Do you understand the consequences and how can we help you? Um, it was about intellectual charity. And intellectual charity is a great way to, to establish and win an argument. When someone, so what intellectual charity is, is where you help build the argument of somebody you disagree with. So someone tells you uh, some information that you disagree with, and you might say, well, if I'm understanding you correctly, then it's also this, this, and this, right? You know, you're, you're helping them build the argument against you. And what that shows to them is that you're listening and that you're understanding. It builds trust. And that's what Chris Voss said is the most important part of this idea of winning this hostage negotiation process. You have to get out those eight hostages. You can't say, keep four, we'll take four, we're good. You know, you can't negotiate this. You have to win this. And the same thing is happening in our agricultural communication. We have to be effective in, these, in getting through this, and it means approaching people by listening and intellectual charity, providing them a sense of power in a conversation which is what we don't do as scientists. We go into that and say, I have the PhD, I've got letters after my name, I've studied this my entire life, I will tell you how to think about it. And I think that that's not the way in which we're going to change hearts and minds. The same thing also was talked about a bit from Aristotle in ways that we can, uh, in ways that we can persuade people. And Aristotle broke down any good persuasion into three parts. 
that you had to have uh, three different areas called ethos, pathos, and logos. Uh, and what this means is pathos, if you think about sympathy or empathy, feeling, um, logos, logic, words. Um, and what you're looking at is the same discussion I framed earlier. Heart versus head, right? Feelings versus thoughts. Maybe even system one and system two, right? Working against each other. Emotions versus reason. And when you have that discussion, especially around food and farming, which one always wins, the heart or the head? Heart, right? So those conversations in the grocery store, those conversations at the farm stand, those conversations are all, all coming from emotional places, and we're coming back with the, that we know in our heads, and that's why we're losing the conversation. The way that we change it, ethos. We talk about our ethics. We talk about our values. Why do we do what we do? Why do you have pride in selling a, an agricultural product? Why do you get up every morning and, and go do what you do 360 days a year? Why, um, you know, what motivates you? What is behind your drives to do this? Why do you want to produce food for a nation? This is the kind of questions that we had, have, have to ask and present to people who are skeptical about what we do. Tell them why we do what we do. I'm a scientist for a lot of good reasons. Uh, when I talk about why I, why, I ta why I do what I do, I talk about uh, expanding the general knowledge the things that we understand about the world around us. I th worry about profitable farming for farmers. I worry about providing more food for those in the world who have absolutely nothing. I'm worried about uh, consumers in the industrialized world that make poor food choices leading to health problems. And I also worry a lot about the ways that we can farm and continue agriculture with better environmental impact. These are the things that I worry about. Farmers, consumers, environment, and the needy. And when I talk about my values and the reason I do what I do seven days a week, probably 18 hours a day, just about every day of the year, that is stuff that anybody who's against science or agriculture can agree with. We're on the same page. We all want the same thing. And the people who don't like agriculture and don't like our technologies, ultimately we all want the same thing. We're not that different. This is something that psychologists refer to as homophily. The idea that we're all on one of a kind. We're actually in the same thing. We just have different ways to think about the solutions. And that's what's a really important part to take home. Leading with your values. So when someone asks you a question about a product that you're, that you're selling or, or what you grow on your farm, why do you do it? Lead with your values. Um, the, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, well, we'll skip the evidence part. Let's move forward to the, to the next part here. The whole thing is basically about this idea of developing rapport, defining an audience, listening and practicing intellectual charity, sharing your values, and then using evidence that is reflecting the, those values. So in other words, we never go to facts until we've established the trust. And then the facts we use have to be consistent with our values. The reason I use this, uh, this insecticide instead of this one is because of its lower environmental impact, the lack of its effects on collateral effect organisms. You know, the facts can come there, but they have to come from a place of values. So the last thing I want to talk about today, and, and then we'll do some question and answer, is how do you participate? How do we do this? And the good news is, is that it's easier than ever. It's uh, simple. If we all do 15 minutes a week, we're going to be in a much better place. The downside is we have to do it in social media. This is where conversations are taking place. They're happening on, on Facebook. They're happening on Twitter. This is where people are going for information, for news, and for, for information about food and farming. They're going into those places for that information, and we're not there. We're not there. Dr. Oz is there. Food Babe is there. They're there steering those conversations that we're not. They're taking our power. As scientists and ag professionals, we have a tremendous wealth of information and knowledge and practical boots on the ground experience that is not being communicated. And so what we have to do is step into those spaces. And what I'll spend the rest of the time is, is talking about the ways we do this right and the ways we do this wrong. There's two ways that you can participate and both of them are very important. And it depends upon your uh, talents, your desires, and how much you really want to participate. But there's ways that everybody can do it. 
It has to be done in two ways, around development of content and amplification of other people's content. The idea is, is that to develop a network of people who are reading your materials of a thousand people. Very easy. If you can share something with a thousand people, and those thousand people share with a thousand people, you have now gotten your information in front of a million people. Imagine that. I mean, it's one out of 30 people in this country, or one out of 300 people in the country that you have now gotten information in front of. Amazing penetration just by using this type of media. And there's two ways that it works. Back in the uh, you know, pre-internet days, you had an expert on television or someone in the newspaper or a physician that you knew that shared information with you and you told your family and friends. That's what networks were. You picked up a phone and called somebody. Hey, guess what I heard? These were our networks. Now our networks are much bigger. Um, the networks, because of the internet, information can travel extremely quickly and you can have millions of people tuned into your message in just a couple of hours. There's also people who are working to stop that, and you've seen what happened with me. You know, people will, um, anytime anything good happens to me, uh, in terms of, you know, I win an award or I'm recognized for something I do, there's people who are there saying, don't trust him because look at, he just uh, is paid by big agriculture companies to lie about science. But um, we push on, and the nice part is, is that now that there's more people participating, that those, those negative messages have less and less of an effect. So the main idea is to be able to understand that we have these networks that are happening. This is actually a real life network from social media, from Twitter. And what it is, is it's people sharing a, si a single keyword. If you don't know Twitter, I would encourage you to, to get involved and learn it. Track me down here during the day, I'll be here all day. I would love to sign you up and show you the basics because it's a great way for you to share information in five seconds. What this is, is this is a map of, of around a certain important term. I don't remember which one it is. But what you're seeing is, is that a person who, this little node down here on the bottom, has now put out a message that's gone to all of these people. And who you want to be is this one here, disseminating good information from like a hub on a wheel, giving good information to many other people. I think I have that role in a lot of ways. Scientists, ag producers, we're over here. Okay, that's us. We're talking to each other. Hey, yeah, great. Yeah, here we're doing. You know. We're not sharing that information with all of these people that want to know. The, here's a concerned mom out here who's looking in um, mom blogs. Here's someone out here who's an athlete who's worried about it. Here's someone who raises horses who are worried about if there's GMO soy in the feed, if it's going to be dangerous for their horses. And we're not talking to them. Other people are. So we need to be paying attention to this and we need to be participating inside that diagram. There's easy ways to do it. We have to stop talking to each other and we have to move beyond our tribes. We have to get out of this room and talk to those people who are concerned. And so how do we do it? Um, it's tough to get us, it's hard to get people to step into those spaces. Um, we normally don't even, scientists especially, I put a note here that we don't write for these people very well. We don't write for a familiar audience. You know, up in our own heads talking about science in sophisticated ways that almost are trying to exclude people from participating. So how do we do it? There's a lot of easy ways we can. And uh, I'll show you some examples from my, uh, from my experience. Cook's Cook is an online magazine with a hundred, one, no, uh, 1.2 million subscribers, and it caters to the foodie, you know, very high-end uh, um, uh, foodie consumer. And uh, I was asked to provide some content for them, and I do um, very frequently. And one of the articles I put up was, here's some facts about genetic engineering that you might not know, and here are the missed opportunities. Here are the good things that we could have done for people in poverty, for that could help farmers, things that we could do for the environment. Um, again, going back to shared values. Um, and I was able to put that article in front of people who would not traditionally be open to that discussion. Um, articles for physicians. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is what I did, but they would love to hear from you. They would love to have your brain spill out on a page and say, here are my experiences and what I know as an agricultural producer. Um, Farm voices are desperately needed and, and, and people want to know what's in their food. They want to know where their food comes from. They want to know who grew it and what, what technologies they used. They, they want to know and this is a way for you to communicate those ideas. 
Um, I put stuff in uh, farm magazines. This one was in Citrus Industry about gene editing, this new technology that's going to change everything in food and medicine. It's already starting. Um, and other parent websites. I do a podcast, and uh, what's nice is to be able to, to create content. The podcast comes up every Saturday morning, and I just talk into a microphone and do an interview with somebody in, in agriculture or science, and we get 20,000 downloads a month. And you think about that, you know, something I do in my office at home that costs me about 50 bucks a month in server space and website fees, that now I'm putting that 20,000 I'm putting that content out to 20,000 people every month who are learning something they didn't know before. And what's really nice is to be able to talk about an issue like where did the coffee plant come from and be able to put that on the websites for things like uh, you know, Maxwell House or Javali or whatever and then have that go out to those networks, getting outside our tribes. The other thing you can do if you don't want to produce content is amplify the content of those who produce it. So in other words, share this information using things like Facebook, Twitter, other types of social media to amplify the message. So if you're not one of those thousand people in the beginning, you can be one of those thousand who are sharing. And it takes five. But what it means is that you're propagating the good information. Um, the idea of amplification is huge. That you can uh, use your networks, the people who trust you and people who know you, Give them that good information. Publish this information anywhere. Put, push the information out through your network sources. Uh, it's really important because and, uh, what I do as a scientist is I take my faculty's work and I put this on places like The Conversation. I write about how a gene from corn has similarity with genes from cancers and how understanding corn can help us maybe find solutions to human disease. This is so important for us to get out there because people always question, why, does, why do people in universities do the research they do? Who cares about an uh, esoteric gene splicing factor from corn? Well, it could have a role in certain human diseases. Really good blogs from farmers, and a really great example is Brian Scott, who's at The Farmer's Life. Brian took a picture of a sunset in his hubcap and got a million downloads. I mean, people want content, and they're curious what's happening on the farm. There are many, many good writers and many good, um, and this is just three, I could have put up a hundred of them. There are many good uh, farmers and ranchers conversations, putting up a little bit about what they do on a daily basis, sharing what, what, what is happening on their farm and in the production of food, and it has tremendous resonance with audiences. Share your experiences. Don't be afraid to step into those conversations. Reach out if I can help you do it. Be a voice for farming and food. Be a, be a voice to defend what we do. It's, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not all fun and games, and there's a lot of hazards that can happen in this. And the last thing I'll leave you with is how to handle critics in constructive ways. The number one thing to remember is that the internet is not a conversation between you and someone who's being difficult. It's not that anymore. It's a spectator sport. For every one conversation that's happening, and so there's like a news article that comes out and it's complete garbage and you know that, and uh, somebody wrote it and then in the bottom there's a comment section. And you put a comment up there that says, well, this isn't exactly as I understand it. And then people will say, well, you know, obviously you work for, you know, Dow and Mary, you know, that whole scenario. How do you respond to that? And you have to remember that you're not talking to the person who made the comment, the negative comments, but you're talking to all the people who are watching. And so you have to keep that in mind. And here's a good example. Um, the final book I met, will mention is called Hug Your Haters. It's a customer service guide um, by Jay Bayer. And Jay Bayer is fantastic. He uh, talks about um, ways in which you can enhance customer service, and especially in the age of the internet. And here's a great example. So um, and the idea of, um, of earning trust by responding with class, remembering the right audience, and always taking the high road. And that, that's basically Jay's message. Here's a good example from Yelp, and I'll read it for the folks in back. Taste of Venice Restaurant, one star, and didn't like it. Um, the food was awful, service her food was awful, service horrible. If you think this is Italian food, go home and open a jar of Prego, you'll be happier. This might taste like Venice if you drank the canal water. I'll never eat there again. Okay, not a happy guy. So the chef who owns the place sees this, and how does he respond? Well, the type 1 brain, the reptile brain, kicks in, <laughs> and he comes out swinging. Obviously, you don't know anything about Italian food. It's my family's restaurant. I hope you never return. We don't need people like you here, okay? 
told him off, right? But now if you're the consumer who's wondering where to go eat, would you go to Taste of Venice? Do you trust Chef Mario? Do you feel he's being responsive and that he's earned your trust? So how could we employ everything I talked about today, from listening, uh, sharing values, to win that person's business back? Or more importantly, even if they never come back, what about thousands and thousands of people who are reading this? How do we change them? We have to employ those tactics. Here you go. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Meals out should be special times, and I understand why you're disappointed. So there's that empathy, that listening. I understand you. I understand what you're feeling. Uh, my family has run this business for 15 years, and customer satisfaction is our first priority. There's our shared values, right? Our values, our family. You know, why, our, why service is important is something we, we really treasure here. We'd love to try again. Ask for Chef Mario, and dinner is on me. I'd like to sit with you and uh, learn about what you found objectionable. We want to get it right. Sorry you're disappointed. Now, would you be willing to go to Taste of Venice? Here's a responsive, interested, engaged person who took criticism very seriously and wants to create the change to be better. That's what we have to do. We have to engage people on the internet, especially the ones who are difficult, in constructive ways. Knowing that everybody's watching in their food. They want to know who produced it. They want to know the facts about food and farming. And you can give them to them. We have to do it in these constructive ways. And we can win this thing. We can defend what's important with agriculture and science just by stepping into this conversation the right way. So um, I've talked about a bunch of things here today. First, by identifying audience, we can uh, get our message out more effectively, that it really starts with this idea of developing a pipeline of rapport so that we can have effective communication through this shared conduit of understanding, that um, we're good at talking to each other, we're not good at talking to them, and we need to do that better. And we need to uh, share our values, generate content, and amplify the work of others. Use social media. It's uh, 15 minutes a week from everybody in this room can make a big difference. And although we never really wanted to go there, it's, uh, it's the place where the conversation is happening. And if we're not in that space, someone else will tell our story for us. We got to be there. Uh, develop and expand uh, your media and generate content for uh, audiences outside your tribes. Handle criticism with class and defend science and defend farmers. Um, the folks who I showed you their blogs, they take a lot of heat and they get critics. But those critics go away fast when other people step in. Uh, the only reason I survived what happened to me uh, was because some people got involved and said, we're not going to tolerate this happening to one of our own. And it wasn't very many people, it was probably five. They didn't want to become targets either. So it's important that we're getting in and that we're, we're leading these discussions. So I will stop there. We have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.